Hi everybody, I'm Alex J. I'm a partner at Gowling WLG based out of London in the UK. Um, and I've been asked to talk a little bit about mediation. Um, in particular, the point I was going to comment on was whether mediation should always be the first port of call for any business that is involved in a dispute and has an issue that they want to resolve. And it's an interesting question. Um, mediation is, of course, a very useful tool to resolve disputes. And when used properly in the right way, it can be a very effective way of seeking a resolution of a dispute on terms suitable to, to both parties. And it can avoid the potentially significant costs and risk of litigation. Of course, any litigation, no matter how strong your claim is perceived to be, comes with a degree of risk and a, a, a time scale that it will take you to see that claim through if you don't reach a settlement. So mediation is a very useful tool. But the question in hand is whether it's always right that mediation should be the first port of call for a business it, when it has a dispute. And that's an interesting point because there will be many disputes where mediation is suitable at an early stage before proceedings are commenced and as a first port of call. But it is certainly not the case that it is right, in my view, to say it is always the first port of call without any further thought. And there's a couple of reasons for that. If you're engaged in a dispute, the pressure that can be brought to bear by bringing a claim, by formally issuing a claim, by serving that claim on your opponents, is very significant indeed. And the effect that that can have and the potential to put pressure on your opponents in any subsequent discussions you might have is very significant. And of course, there will be many parties that might take a view that they won't really engage properly in a mediation or indeed another form of um, alternative dispute resolution before they have actually seen that the claimant party is really prepared to issue a claim. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Issuing a claim itself is a time and cost commitment. You know, once you've issued and served your claim, you're on formal uh, certainly in the UK anyway, which has a, an adverse cost payment system where the losing party generally pays the winner's costs. But issuing a claim brings with it a degree of risk for the party doing that. It's a case of, you might say, putting your money where your mouth is, that you're prepared to uh, engage that risk that if your claim fails, you might have to pay the other side's costs. Now, that is very powerful. And of course, once you've issued a claim, you have a court timetable. Uh, there are deadlines to respond. There is a court timetable and process that will be set down. Time and cost is going to be incurred on all sides. And it's important not to lose sight of the pressure that that can bring to bear. But going back to the question of whether it's always the right option to mediate before you commence a claim, you have to consider in more detail what claim it is you are looking to bring and what your perceived strengths and weaknesses are, the nature of your opponent and what you might need to bring them to the table in order to get the deal that you want. If you rush off to mediate or try to invoke a, a without prejudice discussion too early, you could just make your position look weak and you'll encourage your opponent, but you don't really have the intent to bring the claim and therefore any offer they make is going to be less than it would have been otherwise. There's another point to bear in mind about the type of claim you might have and whether it's appropriate to mediate. Uh, many commercial disputes are very suitable for mediation where you have two parties who are both rational actors who will take advice and they will 
be able to form a view on the risks for them of any claim. Where you have two parties of that nature engaged in a dispute, the mediation can be very successful. If both parties have a will to see a deal done, mediation can work. But if you don't have that, mediation might be more of a frustrating process. For example, if you are dealing with a case where the claim involves allegations of fraud or dishonesty, and if there is a, a, a dishonesty element with your potential opponent, then that can make mediations more difficult to succeed and you can find yourself potentially wasting time um, where you know, games might be played by an opponent who will say they want to mediate but they have no intention of doing anything other than delaying you commencing proceedings, delaying the inevitable from happening. There's a final point that's always worth bearing in mind about mediation and it's that mediation itself is a can be an expensive process. Um, it is of course a lot cheaper than mitigating a claim through to conclusion but it still involves payment of mediators fees, it will involve the fees of lawyers to prepare bundles for mediation and position statements, you have the preparation for the mediation, the day of the mediation itself, all of which can add up to tens and tens of thousands of pounds and if you are going to instigate a mediation before you have ascertained whether there is a realistic prospect of a deal being done on the day, then you might find that you are incurring costs in mediation which won't deliver the results you were hoping. So for all of those reasons, on the question of should mediation be a party's first port of call before it commences proceedings? The answer is sometimes, but not all the time. And you really do have to look in detail at the particular type of claim that you are looking to bring and the particular pros and cons of mediation before you take the step of mediating. And looking further forward, you can of course mediate at any time. Many mediations happen after commencement of a claim for good reasons, that parties want to see what the other side will formally say before they will mediate. So don't think that you have to mediate before proceedings are commenced. You can do it, of course, at, in effect, any time in the course of a litigation timetable. I hope those points have been helpful. And if anyone has any questions, they are free to email me and my contact details are uh, provided through the conference providers. Thank you. Hello, my name is Artem Dudko and I'm a partner in the Disputes and Risk Group at Osborne Clark in London and I lead the team which deals with disputes involving Russia and CIS. Uh, I've been asked to record a short video about the role of in-house counsel uh, in dispute resolution situations. And uh, what I propose to do is to share some of my practical tips from experiences gained to date. So the first thing to bear in mind when dealing with in-house law lawyers uh, in a dispute situation is that probably within the in-house legal team, there is not a, a lawyer who specializes in dispute resolution. There are some exceptions when the teams are very large, but that is not the usual situation. So in the usual uh, course of action, the in-house lawyer will be a lawyer, but not one that specializes in disputes. And this will not be something that they deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So they will be relying on their external advisors to provide them with advice on strategy, on procedure, letting them know exactly what is needed from them, what is needed from the client, and the key component of the information they will require will be to do with the likely costs and timing of the anticipated dispute. This is obviously important because disputes are a cost item for a business. So the in-house legal team will have to be very careful 
in managing the business's expectations as to the anticipated cost of a dispute procedure. What is also important is that both the in-house counsel and the external legal advisor work together as a team because they both bring something to the table and in order for the dispute procedure to be successful, they will need to work together. The in-house lawyer will have a greater understanding of the client business. He or she will also know who the relevant stakeholders and relevant individuals within the organization are who have the best information that will be needed for the dispute. They will also have the access to the client documents and will be really important to explain to them what exactly is needed and what they need to do with all documents, hard copies, electronic documents to make sure that all of those are maintained and used in the dispute resolution procedure. Uh, from the in-house counsel uh, point of view, they will need to get advice on uh, how the dispute will proceed. And at all times, I think they would be interested in knowing about the possibilities for uh, trying to settle the dispute. So that is an important conversation to have with the in-house lawyer so that they can then carry out an assessment of the dispute's cost and value and help the business take a commercial decision about whether it is worth proceeding with the dispute and at what cost. Uh, the, it'll be important that the in-house lawyer and the external advisor communicate constantly and also that there is an element of trust between the two. The element of trust is really important. And I guess the way to develop that is even before the dispute arises. What is really important is to help the in-house lawyer to advise their business on how to minimize the risks and avoid disputes altogether. And this could be achieved through advising them on how best to uh, draft uh, documents and contracts for their various business relationships. It could be uh, by keeping them updated on latest legal developments. And what I found works best is just generally being available uh, so that the in-house lawyer can contact you with any small ad hoc query simply by picking up the phone. And over the years, the fact how you advise the in-house lawyer with those ad hoc queries will help you to uh, to create a relationship of trust with them. Now, let's speak a little bit about the dispute resolution procedure and what is needed throughout the process. So when, when a dispute is likely or perhaps has started and a third party is in some way unhappy with the client and, and has issued proceedings or there is a discussion about a possible dispute, what is really important is to tell the in-house lawyer exactly what they need to do uh, in preparing for the dispute. And the key bit exercise here is to access, collect and store all the relevant materials that could be helpful with uh, with the dispute resolution procedure because they will obviously have greater access to this. From the external legal advisor, the in-house lawyer would expect to hear tips and advice on strategy, what steps can be taken, whether there are things that can be done to improve the dispute resolution position of the client, uh, whether, for example, there could be some uh, steps in trying to resolve the dispute, for example, mediation uh, or negotiation attempts, how to correctly record the client's position in any correspondence with their counterparty. Uh, all of those things uh, will be something that the in-house lawyer will expect advice from the external advisor and assistance with. Also, it will be important to consider what additional uh, third parties uh, it would be necessary to involve 
in trying to get the best result for the client. These could be experts in particular fields, for example, experts in the calculation of uh, financial uh, elements of the of the dispute. It could be industry experts who could provide an opinion about a certain uh, issue in a particular industry. Uh, and, and it could be additional lawyers with expertise in laws of other countries, particularly if it's some sort of international business transaction. So the role of the external legal advisor will be to help the in-house lawyer involve and then coordinate the work of all of those additional uh, parties. As the dispute proceeds, I think what the in-house lawyer will want, let, least of all, is to have surprises. So here it's important to have an open and honest conversation about how the proceeding may develop. And once again, this goes to the issue of trust between the two individuals. Uh, clearly, dispute resolution is an unpredictable process and uh, there is always an element of litigation risk that things may go not as expected, but being open as to what the expectation is and how likely something may happen, but also identifying the potential pitfalls and risks and being upfront about them is something that probably will help in the development of the relationship with in-house counsel. And always it is important reminding them that at any process of the dispute resolution procedure, uh, it is helpful to make sure that they are thinking about opportunities for settling the dispute at a level that is obviously acceptable to the business. And there should be minimum thresholds or maximum thresholds depending on the situation beyond which uh, it will not make commercial sense to settle a particular dispute and it will be necessary then to proceed with the dispute resolution process. Um, dispute resolution generally is a lengthy and expensive process. Uh, so as f you may have heard from some of the points I've made so far, the key takeaway that I would like you to take is that communication with between the external legal advisor and the in-house counsel, a relationship of trust and working together as a team are the elements that in my view would probably maximize the chances of successfully concluding any dispute that arises. But even better is that this kind of working relationship will probably help avoid risks uh, and disputes altogether. Thanks a lot. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Lawrence Lieberman, and I am a partner in the disputes and investigations team at Taylor Wessing in London. I'm going to talk today about the advantages and disadvantages of arbitration over court litigation. Uh, as you'll appreciate, I'm an English law practitioner. And so whilst I have conducted numerous international arbitrations, and many of the concepts that I'm going to cover will be of international relevance, I do come at this topic from an English law and practice lens uh, to some extent. I'm going to deal with the compare and contrast of arbitration and court litigation a little later on in the presentation, but I want to start off with some of the basics around how disputes might end up going to arbitration in order to set the scene. So for arbitration to arise, the contract parties need to agree to submit the dispute to arbitration by way of a valid arbitration agreement, usually a clause within the relevant commercial contract itself, but it can also be set out in a separate agreement or even drafted and agreed to after the dispute has arisen. If arbitration, if arbitration is being considered, then the arbitration agreement should specify all the necessary issues, including what disputes are resolved by arbitration, what, if anything, is resolved by the courts, whether the arbitration should be ad hoc or governed by one of the well-known arbitral bodies rules, how the arbitration tribunal should be composed, whether, should there, whether there should be an escalation process before a party can start arbitration and so on. It's necessary to note the importance of the chosen seat of the arbitration, which is not necessarily the same as the location. The seat is the geographic location to which the arbitration is tied legally. Under English law, the procedural law and framework is the law of the seat, including access to the local courts for emergency or interim relief, such as injunctions, 
challenges to the jurisdiction of the tribunal and challenges to the arbitral award itself. The location of the arbitration, by contrast, may be an entirely practical choice. It's perfectly possible to hold hearings in a location that is convenient to the parties, even if that isn't the seat of the arbitration. And of course, in the current environment, many hearings are held remotely. As I mentioned, it's important to consider the incorporation of the rules of one of the well-known arbitral bodies in the arbitration agreement. The most frequently specified institutions for international commercial arbitration tend to be the London Court of International Arbitration, the International Chamber of Commerce, the Dubai International Arbitration Centre and the Singapore International Arbitration Centre. Although there are, of course, others where, for example, a regional body such as the Hong Kong International Arbitration Centre is commonly selected if one party is Chinese and the other isn't. Now, while the rules, of course, differ from institution to institution, they have the benefit of providing a clear framework for the arbitration, from appointment of the tribunal to emergency relief, the main procedural steps, costs, and so on. And the main institutions also have model clauses on their websites for incorporating their rules into arbitration agreements. They also have panels of experienced arbitrators from which the parties can nominate their preferences. Of course, it's not necessary to apply a particular body's rules and parties can proceed by, for example, using the UNCITRAL rules or an entirely ad hoc arbitration where the parties agree all of the rules that will apply to the arbitration. The obvious disadvantage of an arbitration agreement which doesn't specify any or not many rules uh, is lack of clarity of the process and uncertainty generally, opening it to delay and abuse. Although if the parties approach an ad hoc arbitration in the right spirit of cooperation, it is likely to be faster and cheaper. I'm going to turn now to considering the pros and cons of arbitration as a dispute resolution mechanism when compared to court litigation. It is a generalization, but arbitration can be cheaper than court litigation, notwithstanding the fact that parties do not pay for a judge's time, although there are court fees for issuing proceedings. The parties share, typically 50-50, the cost of paying the arbitrator or arbitrators if a panel of three is selected. Clearly, a sole arbit arbitrator is less expensive, but even with three arbitrators and if an arbitral body is administering the arbitration administrative fees, generally arbitrations can be concluded quicker than in court, which reduces costs. They typically offer finality, whereas appeals with consequent costs are possible in court sometimes more than once. The arbitration procedure is also generally more streamlined, particularly around disclosure of documents, which can be much less onerous than in court litigation, which comprises a large part of the overall court litigation costs. Much of this applies uh, to the speed of, of conclusion of arbitrations, particularly the appeals point, as the parties have a dedicated tribunal for their arbitration, subject to that tribunal's availability, Arbitrations can be conducted, can be quicker to conclude than court litigation where litigants are competing with the public for the court's finite, finite resources. Overall, in my experience, arbitrations are typically not more expensive than court litigation and can often be less and can often result in a final verdict sooner. The next issue is privacy. Uh, for many companies, one of the key benefits of choosing arbitration to resolve disputes is that the process is confidential. Unlike court litigation, there are no public hearings or publicly available documents. That means there is no scrutiny of highly sensitive commercial information, including market analysis and penetration, pricing and profit models, competitors, costs of sales and proprietary processes. Equally, the lack of publicity in arbitration can be a disadvantage for smaller corporate litigants. As is often the case, particularly in certain industry sectors, larger companies joint venture with smaller companies. In these circumstances, if a dispute does arise, the large company may not want to be shown in public to be a difficult partner to engage with, as this may damage its ability to do further deals. As such, the court of public opinion can be a very significant factor for smaller companies. A related issue to confidentiality is lack of precedent in arbitration. For certain sectors, particularly intellectual property rich ones, there may be a concern, even though many cases are fact sensitive, that court resolves disputes arising out of a particular development program, for example, can lead to a public judgment that impacts other proceedings or other programs. Arbitral awards, however, cannot set a precedent. One of the major attractions of arbitration is its flexibility. The parties are free to decide how many arbitrators and of what sort hear the case, the seat of the arbitration, the venue, the language, and whether or not an appeal might lie against an arbitration award. 
A key advantage is the ability of the parties to choose a subject matter expert as arbitrator and, moreover, a non-lawyer when compared to court proceedings where the relevant commercial judge may not have heard, for example, lots of oil and gas cases or technology cases or had any industry experience. To use one example for a sector which I specialize in, in non-patent life sciences disputes, there is often both an intellectual property element and a commercial or contractual element. There may be debate, for example, about the application and scope of the patent, along with pure commercial contractual issues, such as termination rights, breach, measure of damages, estoppel, and so on. In a three-member tribunal, composed, for example, of a patent licensing expert, a former commercial director in a pharmaceutical company, and a senior QC, the parties can select a set of decision makers with the right blend of skills and experience that would not be available in a court context. There's also generally greater flexibility around case management. In the English court, directions to trial are set at a case management conference and the parties have to have cogent reasons for varying and applying to vary the ordered procedural steps and deadlines. The parties to arbitration generally have a higher degree of autonomy on agreeing and drafting their procedural orders with far less tribunal interaction and intervention unless a particular point cannot be resolved. One other major advantage of the flexibility of arbitration is that the parties can agree to draw various different disputes under various different agreements and across various national borders into the same set of arbitration proceedings. In a number of industries, multiplicity of court proceedings in different jurisdictions can arise, with the consequential delay, substantial costs and risk of conflicting judgments, all of which can be avoided through arbitration. Next, enforcement. Many commercial disputes are cross-border with contract parties in two or more jurisdictions. Arbitration lends itself well to this, as arbitral awards are generally easier to enforce across borders than national court judgments. Arbitral awards are enforced by national courts under the Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards, commonly known as the New York Convention, to which currently 164 states are party. National courts are only permitted to set aside an arbitral decision under the Convention in very limited circumstances. A New York Convention award is recognized as binding on the persons as between whom it was made and a local or foreign court will give it recognition on production of the award itself and the original arbitration agreement. It differs from the typical situation on cross-border enforcement of a, cross of a court judgment, which usually requires the judgment creditor to register the foreign judgment before it can be enforced. Finally, the more informal atmosphere and cooperative nature of arbitration together with its built-in flexibilities that I described earlier, means that settlement of disputes in arbitration is common and business relationships have a good chance of being preserved in a way that is less obvious in hard-fought, public and publicised litigation. Thanks very much. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Global Legal Complex. Um, today, we are going to be covering the topic of mediation and arbitration. And in particular, we're going to be looking at the process of enforcement and the advantages and disadvantages of arbitration over court-based um, res dispute resolution litigation, in other words. So here is a, an overview of what we'll be covering today. Um, We'll have a very brief look at what the key drivers are for somebody's dispute resolution strategy, which will help you to decide whether you should be choosing arbitration or litigation. Um, we'll look at then the, the two main different types of formal dispute resolution that we're going to analyze today. Uh, and that's in particular the difference between litigation and arbitration and then each of those in turn. And then we will look at the topic of enforcement, because that's obviously critical to this question of um, uh, whether you choose one over the other. I, I always like to show this slide as a, a, as a start, you know, why do disputes happen? And here you can see that from each of them, uh, the perspectives of these two individuals, uh, they believe that they are right. And that's often why um, formal disputes happen. Um, uh, I'm always tickled at the thought that in fact, originally, when that digit was put, placed on the ground, somebody would have known whether it was a nine or a six, um, but uh, seemingly nobody knows that now. So what are the key dis drivers for a dispute resolution strategy? I think cost is inevitably an important um, driver for, for anybody in a commercial team. 
they'll be asking themselves how much will it cost to use a particular form of dispute resolution and if uh, you choose a particular form of dispute resolution can I recover my costs from the opponent the speed of the dispute resolution strategy is also critical how long will the dispute take do I have to wait until the contract is finished before I start certainty of the process is really important if I get a decision in my favor is it easy for me to enforce it the court is the presumptive forum in most countries the courts of that land um, in general the law grants the courts inherent jurisdiction to hear all of the disputes that arise in that country um, so and, and how does that inherent dis jurisdiction come about well here as you can see I've listed a few countries to give you a sense of in different countries uh, there are different rules that apply now in England we see inherent jurisdiction as arising as a matter of the common law uh, but it's also covered in statute the senior courts act 1981 the civil procedural rules especially rule 3 um, subsection 3 uh, and then it's important as and helpful to look at the wording of uh, Lord Diplock in Bremer Vulcan and South India Shipping Company which is 1981 appeal cases 909 uh, in many other countries, and particularly countries based on a civil law system, uh, you look to the Constitution. So in France, Article 64 and 66 of the Constitution, as well as the Code de l'Organisation Judiciaire. In Italy, again, it's the Constitution, the Costituzione. In Germany, Article 92 of the Grundgesetz, the German Constitution. In Turkey, Article 9 of the Turkish Constitution. All of these particular rules of the Constitution grant the courts the right to hear disputes subject to the law. So where does that take us then? Well, that takes us in this case to look in particular at arbitration and what the law has to say about arbitration. Now, as I think most of you know, arbitration is an agreement between parties to oust the court's inherent jurisdiction. In other words, to take disputes away from the court and for parties to reach agreement um, that their dispute will be heard by a professional neutral. Now, again, that ability to oust the court's jurisdiction is covered by law, is codified and granted by law. So again, you have to understand the legal basis by which you can take the case away from the courts and then give that to an arbitrator. In England, as I think most of you will know, that will be the Arbitration Act 1996. And again, in many other countries, uh, civil code systems in particular, it's a mixture of procedural law, procedural codes, and then in some instances, specific arbitration laws. But as you can see here, in France, the Code de Procédure Civile, Germany, Code of Civil Procedure, Italy, Code of Civil Procedure, in Turkey, I thought that was an interesting uh, uh, example to look at. You have the Civil Procedure Code, which covers domestic arbitration, but then also an international arbitration law covering international arbitration. And finally, in Qatar, which is a country that I'm particularly familiar with, they have a specialist arbitration law, the Civil and Commercial Arbitration Law. I think it's, well, uh, it's worth observing at this stage that arbitration does have a lot in common with litigation. But it is different, and so it should be treated as such. Uh, in my view, I think done properly, arbitration can be a lot more than simply private litigation. So what are the pros and cons of each of these choices of dispute resolution? Well, for litigation, there's usually a low cost for court services, essentially only limited court fees. And enforcement within the jurisdiction, in other words, within the country, in which you are having your piece of litigation, enforcement should theoretically be relatively easy. But there are several cons to be aware of. The proceedings will be held in the national language. So, for instance, if you are in Italy, well, your, your litigation will be heard in Italian. Um, now, that may hand a home field advantage to one party. Let's say you are a British party, but your counterparty is Italian. Well, that will give your Italian counterparty a natural advantage because they are litigating in the home courts they are familiar with in the Italian language, which they are also familiar with. So that may um, have an impact. It will have an impact as well on the, the various languages of the documents that you agreed. If you agreed everything in the English language when you agreed your contract, 
Well, that may not be the language that is used in the court. And you may find that the court will take precedence for your translation instead of what you actually agreed. So that's an important consideration. Proceedings will be in open court. There'll be no confidentiality. You should be aware of the speed of proceedings. In some countries, it can be quite quick, but in others, not so quick. There will be local counsel um, and the role of precedent will also play a part. And critically, you'll have to ask yourself, where are the assets? There could be issues with enforcement. Well, with arbitration, you get to choose the language and you control the procedure through the arbitrator. And the New York Convention means that it's very easy to enforce your arbitration in most countries of the world. There will be cost shifting. So that means the loser will pay the costs of the arbitration or litigation. That could be quite significant if you are the losing party. The costs of the arbitral proceedings themselves are important and need to be thought about. And the, the speed of arbitration, some people can occasionally think that arbitration can be a slow process. And then there's this question of enforcement, needing to enforce uh, because you are not in the courts itself. So let's have a quick look at enforcement. Uh, for arbitration, uh, it's a settled, relatively settled law. It's the New York Convention. And that's a UN convention which most nations have signed up to, 164 out of the 193 UN members. The New York Convention rules tend to be enshrined within the law of that country. So you look to the procedural rules of that country. Now, in litigation, it will depend entirely on which course court has issued the judgment. And then you'll have to look at the court in a different country, which has jurisdiction over a losing party's assets. Now, within Europe, that may involve the Brussels One regulation or the Lugano Convention. But the impact of Brexit is still unclear. The Lugano Convention may apply, but that's not yet certain. There is the Hague Convention, but that only applies to service of proceedings, not to recognition of proceedings. In other parts of the world, you may have regional conventions, the Riyadh or the GCC conventions, for instance, for judgments in the Middle East. But fundamentally, it is difficult, not impossible, but very difficult to get the judgments of one court system recognised and enforced in another country. There needs to be full reciprocity. Now, today's talk is about mediation, so my parting thought is the Singapore Convention. This could be a game changer. If you have a mediation, they could get you recognize and enforce your mediation agreements across national borders. And that convention will enter formally into force on the 12th of September 2020 as a UN convention. No European, at least EU or UK signatories yet, but certainly watch this space. It's likely to be an area of great development and interest in the coming years. I hope you enjoyed this talk. Uh, good morning, friends. Uh, welcome to the morning session of this conference on mediation. And uh, I made a slight small presentation just to help me keep the focus and not exceed the time limit given to me by the organizers. And I'm grateful to events for sure for this opportunity to talk to you all in, in the entire of Europe. So therefore, the objectives of the session today are twinfold. Can mediation be effectively used in connection with arbitration? And at what stage? This is the first objective. How effective is mediation generally? And in what circumstances it is most effective? So therefore, these are generic questions. So therefore, I can straight away answer both the questions. Uh, and uh, I can save my entire 8 to 10 minutes which have been allocated to me. Uh, to just answer uh, these questions, yes, mediation can be used by arbit uh, in arbitration at whatever stage before the award is passed in India. And in fact, in the Arbitration and Conciliation Act of 1996, is on section 30, which ta talks about this uh, option. And then it is encouraged that the arbitrators to save everybody's time can ask the parties to meet somewhere else with a mediator, of course, the arbitrator cannot be a mediator, and come back with settlement uh, agreement. So that is possible at any point of time. And as far as the effectiveness of mediation is concerned, it goes without saying it is definitely effective. And uh, 
it is the least action and without much of uh, procedure and rigor uh, agreement is arrived at in mediation if the parties come to an agreement and that is uh, that can be made a part of the arbitration it award itself so this what this is uh, in some instances my response to these two points but since i've got a little more time i thought i'll just take you through a a little uh, what you call flow of uh, what mediation is all about at least in the indian context so mediation law refers to a form of alternate dispute resolution where the parties to a lawsuit meet outside the court or the arbitration proceedings at a neutral venue with a neutral third party who is not basically deciding on the behalf who is not who is not hearing it he is not he is no judge he is just trying to bring them together and then come Uh, uh, bring uh, them to a common plane. The third party is called a mediator. So, therefore, as I told you, the Section 30 of the Indian Arbitration and Conciliation Act 1996, which is in a part of the Part One of the Act, provides that an arbitral tribunal should try to have the dispute settled by use of mediation or conciliation at any stage. So, similar amendments have been also made in the Civil Procedure Code of India by way of an amendment in 1999, wherein Section 89 has been introduced. Right. to i mean uh, to introduce uh, conciliation and mediation in various proceedings so therefore we see in indian courts the lower courts also the high courts also the judges using the mediation option very often and since india is a very populous country very litigious country there is lot of people before the courts and the courts are very very happy to send those people to trained mediators those mediation centers are attached to the court sometimes most of the times and then the parties uh, most i mean many times uh, it, it they do succeed also unless uh, the issues are contentious unlike the other forms of adr mediation is not binding on the parties we all know about it so the other angle to it is that there is a commercial court act 2005 which is introduced and this is in order to uh, take care and uh, it's a dispute resolution mechanism for commercial matters so all commercial matters should go to these commercial courts uh, wherever these are constituted and in 2018 there is a, a, a compulsory mediation provision which is introduced by introducing section 12a into the commercial courts act so therefore necessarily the plaintiff has to uh, refer the matter for mediation before the uh, suit is filed for the commercial court so that is what is all about commercial courts act then role of a mediator i mean uh, it's we, we, it's an interesting role he does not decide what is right or what is wrong or what is fair right he does not assess blame nor render an opinion on the chances of success if the case is litigated so therefore he is not there judging who is done what and he is not going on a factual inquiry it is basically uh, he acts as a catalyst between the opposing interests and he is trying and attempting to uh, bring them to a common ground so that any miscommunications anything any misgivings are removed and therefore as friends they sit across and the mediator mediating it and trying to bring them to a compromise he moderates and guides the process and tries to avoid confrontation because whenever there is a litigation there is a confrontation element because people, uh, both the parties are not uh, consensus at the item on the same point so therefore they have taken recourse to the courts so therefore the mediator would try to seek concession from both the parties and try to bring them and settle the matter between them that's the role of the mediator what is the mediation process it involves two or more parties in a dispute over any number of issues right it is entirely voluntary for non litigious disputes if the dispute is very litigious right if they are both buying for each other's blood then mediation is no uh, way but then if there is a scope for sitting together and then deciding over a cup of coffee if i can say so so it is also non coercive uh, mediator cannot uh, force any uh, thing onto either of the parties uh, it is it is basically an assisted negotiation it is basically negotiation between the parties where the mediator acts as an assistant not in that real sense but it's it's called assisted negotiation right where the mediator is impartial uh, mediator may provide relationship building or procedural support he can call them to his office to his home or whatever and uh, he may try to open up uh, the uh, uh, issues for them and also facilitate the settlement 
so therefore we can go on talking about the mediation process and all so because the realm of the uh, today's uh, conference is not about uh, the entire uh, uh, mediation process and all we all uh, the audience knows what the process is uh, so i am skipping this slide uh, and components of a good mediation also we know i mean uh, uh, we should build in appropriate clauses in the agreements that before going for dispute resolution by way of arbitration or whatever method mediation is inserted so that uh, there is a chance to uh, uh, settle the disputes without bloodshed then also there should be a uh, undertaking of a comprehensive review of the uh, of the entire agreement before uh, adequate preparing for mediation the mediator should also try to uh provide the parties a platform for generating options and being the feasibility so the avenues for settlement uh, are uh, there for the assist, uh, for, for in the assisted mediation process and the net result should be reaching a mutually acceptable settlement which are agreeable to both the parties right and also the mediator should ensure that if both the parties have signed the settlement agreement it is implemented uh, uh Uh, without any impediment so that is also a good practice to follow for the mediators uh finally let us look at the benefits of mediation because that's that question is there uh, in our realm uh it is quite affordable because you know i mean internationally litigation is extremely extremely uh, expensive so therefore when once the mediation is introduced since the parties are informally sitting across with an assisted mediator who is assisting in the process of uh, settlement it is quite affordable and also it it saves a lot of time in a country like india where the courts are inundated with lots of litigation time is very very important because by the time you get a decision it sometimes it may be years and decades so therefore a lot of time is saved even arbitration process now excuse me i do need uh, your uh, so therefore the amendments have been made so uh, however mediation is the shortest and sweetest if i can say so and these can be private sessions confidentiality is maintained participation in the uh, uh, is there for both the parties in resolution of the dispute with with assistance of the mediator so therefore no i mean no party feels that it has not been uh, it has not played a role in the settlement uh, the best part is that once the mediation is introduced between the parties they may still remain friends because when it's well, somebody is into litigation there's so many strategies which are adopted which makes it impossible for many a times for the parties to work together in the future there may be occasions for working together so therefore this mediation saves that relationship so i think uh, with this i close my uh, brief and short session so therefore with this quote uh, from george pinarcha who said progress is impossible with, without change and those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything so therefore when you are talking about mediation there has to be a change in mind from dispute mongering to settlement uh, kind of an approach so therefore that change is very very difficult for people to make but then if we can't make any progress without we change even in our minds thank you so much